nice to see everybody here today, and I'm very glad to uh, know that the Unitarian Church likes to have things like this because we try to have one every year if we possibly can, of course, in the nonpartisan fashion that we do. Uh, this morning, we have Gunnar Johnson and Sean Reed here who are running for the sixth judicial district seat. And I was explaining to Mr. Reed this morning, I, or yesterday, I looked at his website and saw, <laughs> I did not realize how big the sixth judicial district is. And I have a question for the audience. Who can tell us which counties are in the sixth judicial district? Anyone? Voter education. All right. <laughs> I see one hand over oh, there. Oh, do we have a hand? I think I think I heard this. So St. Louis, Carleton, Cook, and Lake County. That's it. Yep. That's it. That was uh, amazing to me. And also, there are 16 judges within that judicial district. Uh, Meredith, volume up. What? Can you hear me better now? Okay. Is there a volume over there, Will? Beth, better now or I, no? I think that's that's how we usually have it. Just keep it, keep it closer. Is yeah, that better? Okay. All right. We're learning as we go this morning. Okay. So what we have planned today is that each candidate is going to make an opening statement, and then I'll ask the prepared questions, and hopefully. <laughs> We will be alternating the uh, people who answer. Thank God there are only two of you. So <laughs> my husband has agreed to do some timing if they run on forever. So, uh, <laughs> so but I think both of them have done enough of these forums that they know how to kind of judge what they're going to do. At the end of the, uh, the questions that I have, we will ask for audience questions if there's time to do that. And then we'll ask each candidate to finish with a, a closing statement. It's so, oh, Gunnar, yes. We, <laughs> you didn't hear that part. The choir is practicing right now. So you, re you really <laughs> have to put your focus on right here. And hopefully, I think it's going to be 15 or 20 minutes, but that's we have a very open space. so. Do your best, please. Uh, all right, so I'm going to start by asking Gunnar to make his opening statement, and then we'll begin with, and then we'll have Sean, and then we'll begin the questions. Here I can. Okay. Turn and you. On and I'll slide, slide the laptop over. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I would if we move that out of the yeah, way. That's <laughs> what was it? The time limit. Oh, uh, as I was explaining earlier, I think we'll say two minutes for everything, and then if it runs long, then you can wave your sign, okay? Yeah. All right, so Gunnar, could I ask you for your opening statement? You bet. Good morning. It's, it's nice to be back here. Um, I, I remember before this church was built even, and I've, and I've, I've, I've been here, unfortunately, for funerals is the most I've, I've been here, but... Uh, it's, it's nice, and it's nice to be in a community like this. I see a lot of familiar faces, which means that this is a group of people that is active in our community, and that means a lot, and I hope you guys can appreciate that. Um, my name, again, is Gunnar Johnson, and I'm running for judge. As we talked about a little bit before, the 6th Judicial District is a large district in northeastern Minnesota. You've got Carleton County, St. Louis, Lake, and Cook. Um, I, I have been working in the legal field for 30 years. I've done a lot of different things, and we can talk about that this morning. I've been with the Attorney General's office up on the Iron Range doing economic development and litigation for the state of Minnesota. I've been the Duluth City Attorney, and, and that's where I've seen so many of your faces um, because you guys are active in our community with the City Council, with different things that have happened over the past many, many years. 
I uh, am currently in private practice in, in Duluth here. I am the Hermantown City Attorney, as well as the attorney for numerous townships. Um, for In Cloquet, I'm the attorney for the fire department. Um, and then I do a lot of other business development, estate planning, litigation type work. Um, I am running for this position because public service is something that's been very important to me throughout my life. It, when I went to UMD, I'm gonna run out of time here. We can talk about more of this, but I, was, I, I received the Sir Duluth Award, which is an award for public service. And that is something that has been very important to me as I've gone through my career. And I see this judicial position as an opportunity for me to give back as public service to our community. And I see my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Reed, your opening words. Thank you. Let's slide this over. Move the water so we don't spill it. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Reed, and I'm running for district court judge for the 6th Judicial District. Now, in this opening statement, we only have about two minutes. I'm going to try to cover three things really quickly. First of all, the, what this phase of the election really is, why experience matters, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So this phase of the election, I'm calling this the job interview phase of the election. How many here in the audience have been in a job interview before? <laughs> all right, I'm seeing some hands. Some of you are shy to raise your hands this morning. I'm calling it the job interview phase because you, the voters, have selected the two candidates that you want to know more about before you make that final decision on November 5th. So that's what we're here for, kind of the job interview phase. And like in any job interview phase, you should be expecting us to give you specific answers about our own experience. And why is this important? Well, it's important. Well, first of all, before I tell you why the judicial race is important, Please don't judge the race by the position it's located on the ballot. It's on the back of the ballot. I'm, I'm going to interrupt just for a minute. Yes. Uh, even those of us who speak often, we forget to hold the mic real tight. Real to close, the mouth. okay. And if we can turn it up, we've got several people back here who can't hear. Oh, dear. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Okay. It's up as high as it goes without giving, without giving feedback. Well, I, we know. I would say is that if you can't hear, and and if you can't hear just re wave your hand at us because I, I tend to do this sometimes when I'm talking I'm a, I'm a lounge singer in my past life so and I truly appreciate that feedback you know as we're talking in front of large groups small groups or whatever we don't know what's happening out there often so I always encourage feedback. I encourage lively discussions. So raise your hands if you can't hear myself or Mr. Johnson. And are we all set to keep please, going? Please do move up to the front. If you can't hear, please move up. It will make it a lot easier for everybody. And don't be shy. The best seats are always in the front of the house. <laughs> Although if, if I remember my law school days, we always tried to sit in the back of the room. So especially if we didn't do the reading assignment for that week. All right, so I'm on your honor. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll try to honor that. So uh, what I was just about to tell you was uh, I talked about the job interview phase. I want to talk a little bit now about why the judicial race is so important. And I was telling you, don't judge it based upon where we're located on the ballot. We're on the back side of the ballot, usually below the soil and water office uh, election. So. <laughs> I'm telling you that that's the judicial race is the most important race. So flip that ballot over, find us both there first, then go about your business. Now, the judicial race is so vitally important for this one phrase that I've come to adopt. Judicial decisions have real life consequences. I'll give you a couple examples. For example, take a criminal trial. Criminal trial, if there's a mistake made or a judge makes an error, guess what? It ends up in a mistrial. That means trial stops and we have to start all over again. Now, think about that from a crime victim standpoint. You summoned your courage. I'm seeing my time is up already. You're guessing? Anyway, you're going to hear a lot more about me in a moment. Uh, I'll give you all the experience, but judicial races are so vitally important uh, because they do have real life consequences, and that's why experience matters. And I'll talk to you about my experience. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Thank you for a punting. 
Uh, I think you included some of this in your opening statement, but once again, I'll ask each of you, why did you decide to run for this particular office? So we'll start with Gunnar on this one. Yeah, thank you. That, that is a really good question. <clears throat> and so this opportunity came up in the summer. Judge Harris decided to retire and there was going to be an open seat. And, and I thought <clears throat> very carefully about it because this is a commitment that I want to make sure that if I do it, I want to make sure I do it well and put 100% into it. And I thought about public service. I thought about my experience <clears throat> in the law, <clears throat> excuse me, over many years. And <clears throat> I felt that this would be a position that I could really bring some good experience and a good person, a way of dealing with people to the court. And that I feel I have something to add. So, um, <clears throat> and also I, I really value this district. This is an area that I have lived and I have recreated in and worked in for, for many years. And so um, it's a, you know, we, we focus on Duluth, but there is a lot of other communities that make up the sixth judicial district. And, and I feel that I've worked throughout the district and I bring a lot of experience that will be helpful in, in being a judge for, for our area. And so really it comes down to public service I, my time is, is running out, um, and I really look forward to the questions at the end. I think that back and forth is, is really going to be fun. So, Mr. Reed. Would you select oh. that? Sorry, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> it could work out. Okay. Same All question. Right. Same question. Why did I decide to run? And this kind of dovetails into what I was trying to say in my opening statement. I'm running because this position is so vitally important to our community because judicial decisions have real life consequences. Uh, I know what it's like. I've been in courts for 27 years and I've seen what happens when judges make mistakes. I see what happens when cases slow down or get delayed. My experience, I've been in courts 27 years. I've been in nearly, I've been in court nearly every single day during those 27 years. I do criminal law. I'm a prosecuting attorney for the cities of Hermantown and Proctor. I've been a special prosecuting attorney for other municipalities and for the county attorney's offices in the area. I'm also a private criminal defense attorney representing private uh, clients, obviously not in any of the jurisdictions that I prosecute in. I also do civil law. I practice in everything from simple matters, from conciliation court matters, all the way up to complex business litigation. Uh, I also practice in family law. Family law, I've been practicing in that nearly as long as my criminal practice. Uh, family law, my most recent probably area of focus in family law is the post custody or excuse me post decree high conflict custody matter so stuff that happens after you've already been divorced and you're still having arguments over the children and these are the types of cases that judges hear every single day and i want to bring that experience to the courtroom because i know that we can't have delays in cases we can't have mistakes in cases because those cases are so vitally important Delay in mistakes means uh, justice uh, delayed is justice denied. And I want to bring my experience to the 6th Judicial District. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. The next question is going to be, please tell us what experiences you, and training you feel uniquely qualify you for this role. And we're going to start with you, Mr. Reed. Ah. I moved the computer over too quickly. All right, so what training and experience that makes me uniquely qualified? And I think I already started touching on that a little bit. I've been in courts for 27 years. Nearly every single day I've been in court. And I think in order to, for you to take the role of judge, you have to be in the courtroom on a regular basis. You need to see what happens in the courtroom in order to run the courtroom. And uh, I'll, since it's a job interview, I'm going to give you some specific, specific statistics. Um, I've long since stopped keeping track of jury trials and court trials, both criminally and civilly, because I've just done so many of them. And I know I've told you specific answers are important, so here's some specific answers. I uh, went up to the uh, Minnesota court website. You can do an attorney search. If you do an attorney search for my name, 
you're going to get a number, the number of cases that are associated with my name for my 27 years is 11,358 cases. And so that kind of backs up what I'm telling you when I'm saying I'm in courts nearly every single day. Now I've done the same search for Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson for his 30 years has 91 cases. And that's not a, that's not a knock on Mr. Johnson. We just had different career paths. Mr. Johnson's been a city attorney doing more of the administrative work. But being in courts, kind of like learning a language, you need to immerse yourself in the court to make sure you're fluent in it. Think back to when we try to teach ourselves languages. You can do good by reading a book and trying to learn it on your own, but you never really get proficient in it. You have to go in and immerse yourself in the culture, immerse yourself in the language. Same thing with the court system. You have to immerse yourself in it, and that's what makes me uniquely qualified. I'm the candidate here that has actual and significant courtroom experience, and I'll be ready to be your next judge on day one. Thank you. Johnson. Yeah, so the, the question is, what are my, my qualifications and training? Uh, what uniquely qualifies you with sure. training and experience? And, and so I, I went to school at UMD right over here, and from there I went out to Washington, D.C., and went to law school at the American University in Washington, D.C. I, I worked for the Department of Justice while I was in law school. Um, after law school, I was a clerk, a judicial clerk in the criminal, for a criminal court judge. I did that for a year. Um, and then I was in private practice for five years here in Duluth doing a, a a wide variety of things, in, including we, we represented the city of Proctor, we did prosecution, I did a, a quite a bit of trial work. Um, and so from there I went to the Minnesota Attorney General's office and I was one of the two Attorney Generals up on the Iron Range. I represented the IRRRB, did a lot of economic development work, but also did a lot of litigation for the state of Minnesota, um, defended the state fair, um, did work trials for the DNR, did a lot of criminal matters, um, mostly criminal uh, appellate work. And, and then from there, I became the Duluth City Attorney for 12 years. Um, and that's a, that's a very difficult job, being the City Attorney. You're balancing all the things that happen in the city, from the criminal matters, we did about 10,000 criminal matters a year, to the legislative, I'm gonna run out of time here, but, uh, and, and so um, that really gave me a variety of, of matters, I, a wide variety of matters that I, I have experience in. But it also, it's really working with people at the city level and as the city attorney. And so you have the legal stuff, but you also have dealing with people. And, and City, okay, we're going to run out of time here, but we're going to, I'll continue to talk about my background and experience, and um, it's, it's hard to cram it into two minutes. Thank you. Uh, Connor, uh, you're going to answer the next Oh, question. I get the next one. Okay. Uh, this question comes to you. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> this question comes to you through the center. <laughs> Goodness sakes, everything, <laughs> all right. Now it's on, you can hear. Sorry about that, thanks, Kathy. Okay, Th this question was uh, kind of written by Mr. Munger, so it's probably gonna be a little bit not what you're thinking, but okay. <laughs> Do you believe the current bail system is fair? And if yes, why do you think that? And if no, what changes do you think should be made? I love a good Munger question. <laughs> when I, Mark Munger, who is a relative, was the person that hired me and brought me to Duluth back in the mid 90s. And so I've, I've had a deep connection to the Mungers over the years. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to answer that question a little bit differently. The, throughout this campaign, one, a judge, our job is to be unbiased. And I have gone throughout this district and talked to many people this summer and this fall. And there's a broad political spectrum that we have out there. Um, and, and everybody 
no matter where you are on that spectrum, kind of asks a question with a political twist to it. And in my answer has been the same. Um, I will apply the law. I will apply the law. I'm not going to make the law. I am here as a judge to listen to both sides in the dispute, to gather the facts and to understand the individuals that are coming before us. And then I'm going to apply those facts to the law as it's decided by our legislature, by the courts above us. But I'm going to do that in, in a way that's fair to the people involved and in a way that is understandable to those involved in the system. And, and so often we're seeing where more and more people are pro se and I'm going to write decisions and I have, I, and I can talk a little bit about the work I do as a judicial officer. Yeah, please say what pro se is. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and Mr. Reed, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more. Pro se is when you represent yourself in court as opposed to where you have an attorney that represents you. And we're seeing more and more pro se people because attorneys are expensive and there's only a limited number of them as as the needs grow. So I'm going to wrap up and, and hand this to Mr. Reed. Thank you, Connor. I'll move the computer over. Do you need me to repeat the question? I believe the question was, uh, do you believe the current bail system is fair? And if not, what would you do to fix it? Correct? That is correct. All right. So let me answer that specific question. So um, I believe that the current bail system is as fair as it, we can get. Um, it, like any system, nothing's perfect, right? And bail system is basically involves partially economic issues. And whenever we're dealing with economic issues, there is unfairness built into it. Um, now, I've appeared in front of courts many times dealing with bail issues. Uh, how many of you know that in addition to bail systems or bail, putting up cash or bond to get out, that there is also a program called pretrial release? Show of hands, anybody? I see some people there, yeah. So. So what the pretrial release program is, is that you're, if, if you can't put up bail or bond, so that's when you put up money or bond to get out without any conditions, right? Uh, if people don't have the means, they may possibly qualify for a pretrial release uh, status, meaning you're basically entering into a contract with a probation agent saying you're not going to do certain things, you're going to stay in contact with the agent, you're not going to leave the state, that type of thing. So people do have the opportunity uh, through a pretrial release contract to get out without, uh, without putting up the, the bail or the bond. Um, but there is a certain fundamental uh, level of unfairness because some people can afford the bond or they can afford uh, the cash and then they don't have to be subject to release conditions. Um, how to fix that? That's a bigger question. Uh, it's a bigger question of fixing fundamental economic issues. And unfortunately, the courts can only do so much. And as Mr. Johnson indicated, the role of the judge isn't to fix the legislative issues or fix the economic issues. It's something that we can take into consideration when people are standing before us. Because uh, people do have the right to release depending upon the nature of the circumstance. Uh, obviously, you're taking public safety in a consideration, but uh, the bail system, I think, is as, probably as good as a, good as we have right now. Can it be improved? Absolutely. And uh, people that are smarter than me and Mr. Johnson are going to have to figure that out because that goes beyond the scope of the judge's role. Thank you. All right, we're going to get the next right. question. So, <laughs> uh, could you please tell us about your knowledge of the various treatment and specialty courts? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, the, the 6th Judicial District, I believe, has eight specialty courts or treatment courts. Um, I'm going to tell you about it by first just giving you a, my personal example of it. Uh, I did appear, and I believe long ago I might have staffed for a short period of time uh, Judge Florkey's treatment court, DWI court. And what treatment courts, for those of you who are not familiar with them, is it, it's an alternative way for people with certain problems to kind of work their way through the court system. So if you have like a drug addiction problem or an alcohol issue, or if you're a veteran dealing with some post-traumatic stress type issues, there are treatment courts that help you deal with that. Because the theory is if we can try to help you get over 
addiction, chemical dependency issues, maybe some psychological issues. We have a mental health court now too. If we can get those issues addressed, you're likely going to be more compliant with the law. And so my specific example with Judge Florky's treatment court was, uh, I was in his chambers once and he showed me this picture of a guy standing, holding a bike right up by the lake shore of Lake Superior over his head. He said, Sean, I want you to look at that picture. Remember it, now come into court with me. So the judge tell me to go to court, I'm gonna go to court. And I'm sitting there and it's this individual that was in the picture, he was talking to us and he had been through the treatment, pro, treatment court program uh, for a number of years and what had happened, why that picture was so significant was he was struggling with addiction and he was at that point in his life where he was ready to give up. He was gonna literally drive his bicycle into Lake Superior to kill himself. But somehow someone stopped him from doing it. He got into the treatment court system and over time he recovered. He, he beat his demons of addiction and he was in court that day to tell us that story. And I'll tell you what, looking around the courtroom, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And I'm one of the people that didn't have a dry eye. And so that's why I know that treatment courts for the right set of cases is important. Thank you. Same question. Yeah, so as city attorney, I, I was involved with the treatment courts. I, I actually was the attorney that went and, and was the attorney that went to the mental health court for a period of time. We, my office was involved with the DWI court um, and there, you know, there are, the veterans court was one other one that we often got involved with. And let me explain a little bit about why I think there is a really positive role for these courts. Um, if you think of people, we get people get involved in the court system, oftentimes when something's going wrong. Things like mental health and addiction um, are, are big ones that bring people into the court system. And, and so as a judge, you, you have only so many tools you can bring to bear. Um, you can find somebody, but that doesn't necessarily work with everybody, especially people, you know, maybe they're homeless. They don't have anything to give in terms of money. You can put them in jail, um, but that necess doesn't necessarily always help address the problems that are causing the underlying issues. And so these treatment courts are really helpful. Um, almost, it brings almost a, a social worker aspect into the court system and as a way to hold people accountable. And that's, it's important that the courts hold people accountable for their actions, but it's also a way to set them up to succeed, not to get trapped in the web of the court system where they get a $500 fine, they can't pay that. Now it goes, it continues on and on and they get trapped. And so I am very supportive of the specialty courts and I, I've worked with them and as, as we've talked about, in certain situations, they work very well. Thank you. Uh, you're going to hold that, and you're going to do the next question, which is... Uh, oh, 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 excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Please, I just turned it off so I wouldn't make noise. All right. Please, please describe in detail your experience with family or criminal law, family law, and civil litigation, and we'll start with you, Governor. Yeah, so so civil litigation, we'll, we'll start there. Um, over the my 30 years in the court system, I have, I have been involved in civil litigation. I, I am involved in it now, um, and I've got cases I'm working on now. I, so with, with, I, Right now I have, I just finished up a tax matter for a local nonprofit that, that helps um, people with disabilities and the Department of Revenue took away a certain tax benefit for them. We went to court and just resolved that a week or two ago. I, I have a number of local businesses that I help and I'm litigating to collect 
for mechanics liens matters that they're doing. Um, I've, I've done a whole wide variety of litigation from um, real estate litigation for the Minnesota DNR. I talked about personal injury defense for the uh, state fair. Um, I've done arson cases and insurance cases. Um, I've done trial I've done trials before judges, trials before juries. So, you know, it's anyway, there's there's a lot over 30 years that, that I've done in the civil side. On the criminal side, um, I was the city attorney for 12 years. We, our office handled about 10,000 criminal matters a year. Um, I wasn't always in court on those, but I was responsible for those and and put a lot of focus into DWIs and to um, domestic violence type matters. I felt that they were very important to the public safety of our community. Um, and, and then on family law, I, I have done family law cases. It's not the area of practice that I have focused on, but mostly as a, I've, I've been in family law cases as a volunteer attorney. I've, I've been very active. I, I think it's important to give back as an attorney. And so pro bono has been a big part of my career. Um, I am currently doing pro bono work with the Legal Aid Society, and I've been doing that for a while. I did a trial this past year on a, it's, it's called wage theft. And there's a new law that came in and I hadn't, couldn't find any cases that had been done on it. And so we went and tried that case for a woman um, and was successful and then had to collect from the, the, uh, the business that she worked with. And, and that brings up many of the issues that we see in court, um, issues with poverty, issues with access to justice, issues with transportation, mental health, housing, all were involved in those cases that I've dealt with, with, uh, with legal aid. Um, my time is up. Thank you. And tell if I can just get the question once more. It was uh, specifically describe I'm your sure. criminal law experience, family, family law, law, and civil, civil litigation as well. All right. I think I heard someone in the audience say that was an awful lot to discuss in two minutes. So. Yeah. Here goes, and the good thing is I've been talking a little bit about my experience already. Criminal law, first of all, uh, I'm a criminal prosecuting attorney and a private uh, criminal defense attorney. I've been trying cases for 27 years. Family law, I've told you a little bit about that. I've been doing that for nearly as long uh, as that, as my criminal law practice. Um, and likewise, civil experience, I've been telling you a little bit about that as well. Um, but this is a, I'm calling this a job interview, so I want to talk about the specifics. And I've already given you some statistics. I've long stopped taking uh, track or keeping track of my jury trial experience. Uh, but I just want to make sure that, it, that, that you heard some of the answers from Mr. Johnson here today about specifics. So specifically with respect to criminal law, he referenced his experience as the Duluth City Attorney. One thing that he did say Specifically, I wanted you to make sure you heard that he was not in court for those criminal cases. That's important. You need to be in the courtroom to have that experience. Uh, likewise, earlier you talked about his criminal appellate experience at the Attorney General's office. Appellate work is not district courtroom work. You're not in court trying the cases. Um, with respect to family law, family law is very important. Family law takes up a big chunk of our calendar in the district court, and you need to have that experience. Mr. Johnson has told you that he has some experience. He's tried some of those cases. I've looked at his history. Uh, he's tried five cases. All those five cases happened before 1997. Why am I telling you this? 1997 was a long time ago, but what happened since 1997 is that the family law laws changed. In 2001, we adopted the early neutral evaluation system, which is part of our family law process now. So instead of running to court and getting a trial date right away and you're fighting with your ex over the children in the courtroom, you're going through this neutral evaluation process. And that still exists to today's date. And it's important that you have attorneys and judges that are experienced 
in that early neutral evaluation process because if you don't, cases drag on and they don't uh, get resolved. And I see that my time is up. Thank you very much. Okay, Sean, if you'll keep that. Next question is, please tell us who your judicial role models are and why. All right, thank you for that. And that's the mentorship question. And we see that quite often. And if any of you have been paying attention to some of the other forums that we've been at, um, uh, my judicial mentor, uh, first of all, there's, let me just say this, the sixth judicial bench, we are blessed. We have a lot of good judges on the bench. Uh, when they're on the bench, I'm not going to talk about them specifically because that's probably not clearly appropriate. So I limit my answer to retired judges. And there's two that really come to mind. Uh, one, if you follow me, is uh, Judge Florkey. Obviously, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, he's a judicial mentor of mine, a uh, large part because of the manner in which he conduct himself in the courtroom. You walk in the courtroom and he had a way about speaking kind of soft-spoken, he kind of let the air out of the balloon, so to speak, take the stress out of the room a little bit. Because uh, if, you, if you're in court, and probably many of you probably haven't been in court, being in court is usually not a good day for you. You're scared, you're terrified, you don't know what's going to happen, and you need someone to kind of let the air out of the balloon, let, things are gonna, let you know that things are going to be okay. Judge Florkey had that temperament about him, and uh, I like to think that I emulate that when I'm dealing with uh, people, uh, whether my private life or in my professional life. One other person I'll mention too is uh, Judge DeSanto, and I can mention him now too because he's now, I believe, officially retired, and I think he's off senior status because he just is in the process of moving to South Dakota now. And the thing, uh, thing about John is uh, John is just one of these guys that uh, he treats you right. Uh, he's honest with you, um, and he's just kind. And, and you do need that kindness. But your judges also need to be able to drop the hammer, the proverbial hammer, from time to time if people aren't doing what they need to do. And so those are, my, those are the people that I would look to as my judicial mentors. And I'm not sure if my time is up yet. 15 seconds. So again, let me just reiterate, we, we are blessed with having Good judges on our bench. Thank you very much. And now, Gunnar, same question. And then, if you in the audience have questions, we're going to be able to take a few. So be thinking. Go ahead. Yeah. So I've talked a little bit about what kind of judge I would want to be if I'm elected, and 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 really, you look to your mentors and and. I've always, it's easier to copy somebody else than to figure it out yourself. And so um, I, the first one I would mention is, is Judge Mark Munger. Um, Mark, as I talked about before, was the one that hired me when I came back to Duluth after law school. Um, and I was with him, practicing with him when he became a judge through this very same process of an election and, and Mark, showed me the path and, and very much inspired me to run for this position now. Um, when I was first starting out, there was a judge called John Oswald. Um, and I liked John because he was very straightforward. He controlled the courtroom well. He dealt with things in a very practical, practical and reasonable manner and, and taught me a lot about being in the courtroom. Um, we also have Judge Tarnowski, which, you know, I think it's important to mention her. She recently passed away, but was very instrumental in a lot of these specialty courts that we talked about today. Um, and then I, I, another one is, is Judge Sweetland. Um, I remember appearing before her many times and, and she had a, a nice way of dealing with cases. Um, the other thing I would I would mention is there, I have a certain tree of judges that have have come from me, and so um, as city attorney, I brought in Teresa Neal to be our our, our downtown nuisance and blight prosecutor, and then now she is on the bench, and I I brought in Steve Hankey to be he was the first attorney I hired as city attorney, and now he is on the bench. And um, 
And then Kate Baker is a, it's a judicial officer, which is not exactly like a judge, but it, very similar. So that's, my time's up. That's it. it worked out perfectly. Thank you. All right. Thank you uh, both for the, these are the questions that we have. Now we're going to go to the audience. So does anyone, oh, I see we have All some right. questions here. All right. Let's, let's begin okay. Uh, this is on? It's on. It's on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, what I'm concerned about in a judge is not only that you uh, minister of justice, you match the consequence to the legal requirements, but also that that where the opportunity is, you create uh, or match people with opportunities to actually improve themselves, and not only just to administer uh, so-called justice, but also to point people or to make it possible for people to. Uh, Meet some cut, meet uh, some opportunities. Yeah, let me let me just address that. Um, <clears throat> when I when I became city attorney, we went down to the legislature and worked with other municipalities to, to put forth what we call the driver diversion program, and it, it's exactly like you talked about. There there are people that drive and then they lose their license and they get trapped in this downward spiral where they don't have a license but they have to drive to work to get the money to pay the fine and then they get picked up again and pretty soon they can't get out of it and so that driver's diversion program worked out a system that allowed them to get insurance to pay their fines but also to to continue to drive and to work. And it, so it balanced the safety of our community with the needs of people to not get trapped in the system like you talked about. Move the old laptop over. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, sir. Richard. Richard? Richard Dewis. All right, Richard. It's a very good observation. Uh, so uh, Courts aren't just meant to punish. Courts are trying to try to help solution. We talked a little bit about the specialty courts here today as well. I think the other thing uh, that helps people is the manner in which judges talk to the people that are appearing before them. You've heard me talk about it a couple of times that people that are appearing in court are often having their very worst day. So you have to take the time, you have to communicate with them, treat people with respect and dignity. And so that, so they feel like they're being treated with fairness. The other thing that happens in courts all the time is it's not just the judge. The judge is working with other key justice stakeholders. You're talking with probation officers. A lot of times there are social workers involved and they're making recommendations to the judge. The attorneys are making arguments to the judge to what, what certain requirements can, uh, can, a, pe can a person uh, take advantage of to get them off that cycle of crime or whatever the economic issues that Mr. Johnson mentioned. So it's important that judges listen to the key stakeholders that they're working with and that uh, they communicate fairly uh, and treat people with kindness too because I've seen people leave the courtroom and actually say I've never had a judge talk to me like that and I've seen people say that and it's actually it's touched them and I would venture to guess that they probably are going to go out in the world and maybe make different choices. We have a question from our online Zoom audience. Um, Penny, Penny, yes. Penny is asking, can you describe an example of a judge you've seen in action and thought how you would do things better? You want to do I take this one first? All right. So uh, how not to do it probably. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not going to use any examples up here because, again, I think we're blessed by having uh, good judges on our bench. But I'm going to go down to the Twin Cities area where I've practiced before. And really what it comes down to, I think, is when the judge starts thinking about himself or herself more, uh, making them be the most important thing in the room, they're not. The most important thing in the room is everybody else, and in particular, it's the people that are appearing before the judge. I think what, when I've had uh, bad examples or bad experience with judges, it's when the judges are suffering from what I like to call robitis, 
Uh, it's, uh, I got this robe on and I'm the most important person. And, and we're not there because of the judge. We're there because something has happened that's caused us to bring, to be before the court. And so what I'll do is I always try to keep in mind that it's not about me. You have to have that sense of humility and you have to remember it's about the people in the courtroom. It's not about the judge. So a judge that, <clears throat> when you're an attorney, you have cases and I'm a competitive person. I like to win. I like to do the best job I can to, to put my case forward. Um, I work very hard. I, I lay at night and I think about my cases and I think about arguments and ways that I can do the best job for my clients. And sometimes you go to court and sometimes you lose. And, and that can be very frustrating. You, you feel very strongly about your case, about your client, about what you're trying to do. And, and you can be like, oh, that judge, he or she, you know, didn't do a great job. But it, it, that is the process. And, and it's a competitive process. We're adversarial, where there's, I'm laying up awake at night thinking about my case. There's another attorney on the other side doing the same thing about his or her case. And so sometimes it doesn't work out the way you, you want. I look to a judge to do the hard work, to listen to both sides and do the best job he or she can. Sometimes I don't feel like it's exactly the right decision, but that is the decision that we live with and move forward with. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to say that we'll take your question, then we're going to allow a time for your closing statements, which are going to have to be brief, John. <laughs> yeah, so go you. ahead. I'm Ulrich Goddard from Cadizan Township. Oh. What I would like to ask is, um, we see on some of the higher profile cases, delays after delays, appeals after appeals, What's your thought about doing the job so you don't get delays after delays and appeals after appeals? Because I believe as citizens, we have a right for prompt justice. Thank you. Um, let's see, when we start with you, All right. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna address the, the district court portion of that because appeals are obviously outside the judge's control with maybe one exception, I'll tell you this. If you have a judge that's making a good decision, uh, maybe there'll be less appeals, right? So that's why experience matters. Um, judges, district court judges do have control over their courtroom and they do have control to a certain extent over the scheduling of matters. If you've ever been in court, especially some of the procedural type cases, uh, the attorneys will come in on a case and either it's gonna proceed for that day with a plea or something being put on the record or it's gonna be moved down the road for trial or other, other things. Um, the one thing that a judge can do is make sure that the parties and the attorneys appearing before them are moving the case forward and that we're not continually kicking the can down the road, as I like to say, uh, to another day. Cases need to move forward and judges are the ones that are in control of their schedule. Now, there are some things that are beyond all parties' control. Sometimes discovery is very extensive uh, sometimes there's issues that need to be litigated beforehand, like a contested hearing, but judges can move those things along, and judges should. And that's another reason why you need experience in the court review. You need someone that knows what they're doing, that's been there before, so that they can marshal the cases and keep them on a straight line track. And it's so important because, like I said earlier, justice delayed is justice denied. Thank you. That's, that's a good question. Um, I am not going to come out and say quick justice is, is the way to go. Our, our judicial system is a process, and it's a process that's developed over hundreds and even thousands of years. And we, we envision a judge hearing both sides, slamming the gavel and saying, you win, you lose. And it doesn't really work that way. There, 
there's a process of starting a case and then on the civil side, discovery, motions. And so different cases have different time frames that they take. And I have been involved in some very high profile and very complex cases that have dragged on through many different courts for over years. That's frustrating, but that's the process. Um, and as a judge, I will bring this to the, the case, is that I will manage the process. I will make decisions in a timely manner. I will keep the, the parties moving along. And I will issue decisions that I think are fair based on the facts and the law. And if the Court of Appeals feels differently, then we will deal with that and go forward. So um, I appreciate your frustration, but it is a process rather than a goal exactly. Thank you. Connor, why don't you keep that in both of you? I'm sorry, but services will start at 1030. So I'm going to give you each one minute to wrap up. And Gunnar, you've got the mic. So you go ahead and do your closing statement, please. Yeah, well. Let me just start out by thank you for, for having us. Um, this has been a long campaign. It's, it's been really a wonderful experience, but it's, it's been a lot of work. I have traveled throughout this district, talked to a lot of people, and I really appreciate you guys putting this on. Um, and so thank you very much. I, I hope I could talk on more, there's more stories and, and examples and that type of thing. But I really hope that, I appreciate that you guys are interested in this election. I hope that you consider me. I know that whoever is elected is gonna do a good job as a judge. And um, it's good to be back here in this church. Thank you. Thank you. I do wanna thank everyone for having us here today. Um, I started this uh, uh, forum today talking about the job interview process, and that's exactly what this is. It's a job interview. It's one, like one of the longest job interviews I've ever been on. Uh, but I'm talking about experience, and I think that's what you guys want to know. You want to know what our experiences are, what our qualifications are. And uh, with the message I want to leave with you is that experience actually matters. Because again, why judicial decisions have real life consequences. And we need someone in the courts that has the experience. And quite frankly, I'm that candidate. And I'll be ready to be your next judge on day one. If anyone has questions afterwards, I know this is a very limited type communication thing. I'm happy to stick around, talk to you. You can reach out to me through my website, readforjudge.com. Happy to have phone calls, other forums, small group, large group discussions. But thank you so much for coming out. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you very much.